Let's paint a picture of what's happening here in this part of Scripture. Last week we set the stage. This week we're going to paint a picture anyway. As always, we need to understand the context. Yes, the context of what is happening. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to grab your Bible, open to John chapter 8. If you're at home, go ahead and do the same thing. Grab your Bible, open to John chapter 8. We're actually going to go to John chapter 7, verse 53, but it's the very last verse of chapter 7, so it's easiest just to start at John chapter 8. Most of you that are looking in your Bible right now, you probably see a little note there. It might be in line with the text, it might be a footnote. Most modern translations have a note like this. If you're reading from the King James, you probably don't have a note. I don't think the King James or the New King James has this note. But right before John 7.53, there's a note in my Bible, I'm in the New International Version, that says the following. The earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7.53 through 8.11. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part after John 7.36, John 21.25, Luke 21.38, or Luke 24.53. So what does this mean? Well, the story that's here is a very, very well-known story as a part of Jesus' life. Non-Christians know the story that's included here. This is the story, uh, John, 8, or John 7, 53 through 8, 11, is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Teachers of the law and the Pharisees are about to stone this woman, and Jesus is there and he says, let any one of you who is without sin, be, first, be the first to throw a stone at her. Gradually, all the Pharisees and the teachers of the law drop their stones. Jesus looks up, asks the woman, has no one condemned you? She says, no. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now, go now and leave your life of sin. And there's a phrase, and this is where the phrase, let he who is without the first stone, or let he who is without sin cast the first stone. You can't throw a stone if you don't have one, of course. Let he who is without sin Cast the first stone. And we love that phrase, right? This is where that phrase comes from. So why is this story included here? If the earliest manuscripts don't have this included, or they have it in a different place in the Bible, why is it included right here? If it wasn't there originally, why is it included? Shouldn't we take it out? If it wasn't there originally. Well, let's, let's try to look at that real quick. Did it happen? Likely, yes. From what I read, it's probably part of the oral tradition from the early church. It's something that Jesus did. This is an actual event that took place in the life of Jesus that the people knew about. But for whatever reason, it just wasn't included in one of the four Gospels. Now, is that a problem? Knowing that this story, knowing that these verses didn't make it into the, any of the four Gospels originally, is that a problem? Well, is the Bible an all-inclusive retelling of history? Does it tell us everything that Jesus did here on earth? No. Because what does John tell us about the things Jesus did? Staying in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then John finishes up his Gospel by saying this, John 21, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have the room for the books that would be written. That's an incredible thought. So there is a lot more out there that Jesus did than is recorded in our Gospels. So the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery, it's valid teaching. It's good teaching for us. It absolutely lines up with everything else that we know about Jesus. But we do need to understand the passage for what it is. It's something that was likely added later to John's gospel. 
And I say all of this because the context idea, okay? So in order to figure out the context in which Jesus says, I am the light of the world, we're going to take this section, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, and we're, just, we're going to set that aside for a moment. Just for a moment. Don't get rid of it. Don't take a Sharpie and scratch it out of your Bible, okay? We're going to leave it there. We're just going to set it aside for a moment to understand the context of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And to get that context, we go back into chapter 7. Jesus, at this point, is in Jerusalem for the festival of tabernacles. Now, biblically speaking, what is a tabernacle? When we look at it from a biblical perspective, we're going to call it a, a lightly built building. It can be fixed or it can be movable. Generally, that well, it, it is one, something that somebody can inhabit. Okay. Modern day tabernacles don't really fit that definition, but biblically speaking, it's a lightly built building. So you know that metal shed that dad built in the 80s out in the backyard? I guess if you lived in it, we could call that a tabernacle. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. You guys remember those metal, thin metal sheds from back in the 80s, right? The doors never moved. Yeah, we got one back here. So. <laughs> But prior to the temple periods, the Israelites had a tabernacle that God instructed them to build. Remember? It was portable. They could pack it up and take it with them. And that tabernacle was the dwelling place of God here on earth. It's God inherited. It inherited, inhabited, excuse me. God inhabited that tabernacle. The festival of tabernacles is something that is still celebrated today. It is commonly known as Sukkot. And Sukkot takes place in the fall of the year. This year it is in late September. So if you decide you'd like to embrace the Jewish roots of Christianity and celebrate Sukkot in late September, we could probably build some tabernacles outside, some little huts, and we can hang out in them for a week if you guys really want to. And if you want to know more about it, there's tons of information online. Go ahead and look it up. Just make sure you find a legitimate source. The internet is full of a lot of well, not good sources. But this, is, this festival, the Festival of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, is a festival that God told the Israelites to remember. And we get that out of Leviticus. I'm going to read you part of Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days, present food offerings to the Lord, and on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present a food offering to the Lord. It is the closing special assembly. Do no regular work. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day also is a day of Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in such shelters, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. That is the festival of tabernacles. Another part of this festival was a great lighting of candles. There's a, um, a writing called the Mishnah Sukkah, which... Again, you don't need to necessarily remember that. That's kind of a Jeopardy question if you're doing that. Basically, it's talking about the laws surrounding this festival, the laws surrounding Sukkot. And it says this. This was the sequence of events. At the conclusion of the first festival day, the priests and the Levites descended from the Israelites' courtyard to the women's courtyard. There were golden candelabra atop poles there in the courtyard. And there were four basins made of gold at the top of each candelabrum. And there were four ladders for each and every pole, and there were four children from the priesthood trainees, and in their hands were pitchers of oil, 
that they would pour into each and every basin. From the worn trousers of, of the priests their, and their belts, they would loosen and tear strips to use as wicks, and with them they would light the candelabra. And the light from the candelabra was so bright that there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated from the light of the place of the drawing of water. What a sight that must have been. Can you imagine this? The light was so bright from these candelabra that were lit that not a courtyard in Jerusalem was not illuminated. Think about our Christmas Eve candlelight service for a minute. We take that candlelight from, from the Christ candle when it's down here. We start out very dark, and I try not to trip over things as I pass that first light to someone. But as we do that, all the lights are off, but then the candlelight spreads. And by the time everyone gets that light, the whole sanctuary here is illuminated. Now that is pretty impactful when we see that. Can you imagine that these candelabra now in this courtyard of the temple are so bright that they illuminate the city? How amazing is that? Jesus says to us, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Verse 20 in chapter 8 of John says, He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. One source that I read said that this was likely the women's courtyard where this took place. When Jesus said this, he was likely in the women's courtyard, which is the same place as that great lighting of the candelabra during the Festival of Tabernacles. Now, we don't have enough information to infer that Jesus said, I am the light of the world during this lighting ceremony. But it is likely that it took place where the candle lighting ceremony took place. And there's an important connection with this. Remember last week we talked about the bread of life? How Jesus says, I am the bread of life the day before that. What happened the day before he said that? Do you guys remember? There was a miracle that took place. Feeding of the 5,000, yes. With five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus fed 5,000 men. Those, those, those people there were physically fed. Their physical hunger was satisfied by Jesus. And then the next day, he says, I am the bread of life. And he says that to at least some of the people that were there that received that physical bread the day before. So there's that connection. One day gives them the literal miracle bread and then the next day says, I am the bread of life. Now back to our festival. Jesus is speaking now to people that at the very least, within the last day or two, have seen this great candle lighting ceremony. And now they're standing where that ceremony took place. The people there have witnessed something incredible. Now in this case at the festival, it wasn't, it wasn't a great miracle that took place that caused these candles to light. This was part of the ceremony. But still, what a, what a sight to see. And now Jesus in that very place is saying, I am the light of the world. Jesus gave the people bread, then he said, I am the bread of life. The people see this great candle lighting, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Throughout history, light has been associated with God, associated with capital G, God, our God, one God. It's been associated with little g, God, and little g, gods that have existed throughout, well, that people have believed have existed throughout time. Regardless of a person's religion, light and God or God or gods, they've been joined together. As the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, what led their way? There was a cloud during the day, right? What led their way at night? 
pillar of fire. What does fire give us? It gives us heat and light. Yes. Here Jesus says, I am the light of the world. What I find so interesting in this section is the reaction to Jesus' statement. The Pharisees don't argue with what Jesus says. The reaction to Jesus is this. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And you know what? They're biblically correct on this one. They're technically correct because in Deuteronomy we're told this. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Essentially, just because one person says it doesn't mean that it's true. Someone must have corroboration. You must have evidence to back up what you're saying. Let me say this again. Just because one person says it, regardless of who that one person is, it does not mean that what they're saying is true. My friends, I expect you to do this with me. Don't just accept what I say to you. Go to the Bible and see if what I'm saying is true. Ask God to show you in Scripture what is true and what is not. The Old Testament says we need to have witnesses. The New Testament tells us that as well. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is telling us about sin within the church, about discipline within the church, which is not something we really like to think about too much. And in this section, we actually have one of the most misused verses of Scripture throughout all of the Bible. But let me paraphrase to you Matthew 18. Essentially, uh, it says, if, um, if a brother or sister sins, go and tell them. If they hear you, good. If they don't hear you and they continue in sin, take one or two others along so that there's... Uh, that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Jesus says it here in Matthew, just what is said in Deuteronomy. Then if they refuse to listen, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen to the church, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. Which, how did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? He was kind to them. He still dined with them. This isn't a situation where you cast someone out of the church and shun them. You, you still got to dine with them. You still got to Still got to be there with them. But verse 20 says this, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And we've, we've confused that a little bit because here Jesus is talking about agreeing on, agreeing on sin, agreeing on different things with, with discipline or whatever you want to call it. But we've turned this into something like, well, you know, we only had two people at worship this morning, but where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there with them. The problem is if we keep saying that, it means that Jesus isn't present when I pray by myself or when you pray by yourself. And God is there when you pray. So let's, let's, let's look at this verse for what it is. And let's not confuse that as we go forward. Anyway, that's a little bit of an aside. So yes, the Old Testament and the New Testament both say you need witnesses. So the Pharisees are technically correct in what they say, uh, that a person cannot be their own witness. Here's the thing. I don't think it mattered what Jesus said here. I think they would have had the same reaction. I am the light of the world. Can anyone back you up on that? I am a porcupine. Really? Anybody ever see you as a porcupine? I am a box of lucky charms. Mm, I, I don't know, you don't appear to be magically delicious. Jesus could have said anything. The Pharisees weren't arguing with what he said, they were arguing that he couldn't just say it and expect to be believed. They said, someone else has to come and back up your statement. Someone else has to corroborate what you are saying. And how does Jesus respond to them? He basically says, well, yeah, technically you're, you're right. Verse 17, in your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. Verse 15, you judge by human standards. 
The entire response of Jesus is this, verses 14 through 18. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, the Pharisees, Where is your father? Where is your father? Bring him here so he can testify for you. We don't believe you. Bring your father here. They won't listen to Jesus because they don't know who Jesus is. And they don't know who Jesus is because they won't listen to him. They won't listen to Jesus because they don't know who he is. And they don't know who Jesus is because they won't listen to him. It has been forgotten at this point that he even said, I am the light of the world. There's not an effort to understand what that statement even means. The argument is that Jesus can't be believed because no one is testifying on his behalf. They don't understand that someone is testifying on his behalf. His father is backing him up. What else is going to be speaking to who Jesus is? How many miracles has Jesus performed up to this point in his ministry? Do not the miracles testify that Jesus is the Son of God? Don't his miracles testify that he is, as he says, the light of the world? The decision that every human has to make today is what the Pharisees were arguing. Here in 2021, when we hear what Jesus says, when we hear the gospel, when we hear testimony about Jesus, we have to go through the same thing the Pharisees are arguing here. Do we believe what Jesus says about himself? Now believers, we believe that. I think everybody in this room is most likely a believer. We believe when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. We don't question that. Because why? We know who Jesus is. What else do we know? We know who his father is. So we understand that he testifies for himself and that his father is backing up that testimony. But what about the world out there? Will they accept who Jesus says he is? Will they accept what Jesus says he is? So what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the light of the world? Here we are, what, 23 minutes or so into this message. If I remember what the clock said when I started. And I'm finally getting to this question. And I think it's taken me this long to get here, frankly, because... The message Jesus gives us is actually quite simple to understand. Think about it. We know this. We know this stuff. Who is the prince of darkness? I was thinking Ozzy Osbourne, but yeah, you're right too. (laughs) Satan as well. Biblically speaking, light is good and darkness is bad or evil. Now, as humans, we've, we've perverted that idea into some pretty messed up things over the centuries. But biblically speaking, light is good and darkness is bad. And how does John start out his gospel? What does he tell us? The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the goodness sent by God to earth. 
And what is good? Where does good come from? It comes from God. As James tells us, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. That James has some good stuff to say. Maybe we should do a series on James here soon. If Jesus is the light of the world, that means that he is every good thing that is. It means that he is the hope for the world. My brothers and sisters, let us hear this message today and let us proclaim to the world through word and through deed that Jesus is the light of the world. And through that word and through that deed, let us proclaim as God works through us that whoever follows him, whoever follows Jesus, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, you have sent the light into the world. Lord Jesus, we accept, we know that you are the light of the world because we know who you are. But God, so many in this world do not know who you are. So many do not know who sent you. So many do not know, Lord Jesus, who your Father is. We pray, God, that you would work through us. That through us, Lord God, you would show the world around us your light, your love, your goodness, your grace. Let us take this statement home with us today. And remember that you are, Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. In your precious name we pray. Amen.